Introduction to Interlocking Systems, Control Tables, or more about how to stop trains from colliding with stuff. This lecture is part of the pre-study for railway control and digital systems. By the end of this session, you should be able to explain the context of control tables, explain concepts and terminology used in control tables, and design a basic point control table and route control table. Note that there is quite a bit to control tables. From a design perspective, the standard UK training course for basic control tables is one week long, and the course for advanced control tables about, is about half of a two week course. From a testing perspective, the first week of a standard UK principles tester course is about control tables. So in the next half hour or so, we are only going to be able to touch on the highlights. Let's start by looking at the context in which control tables live. The signaling design process starts, funnily enough, with design inputs. I have a captive audience of track and civil engineers, rolling stock engineers, traction engineers and operations people. So if you thought I wasn't going to utilise this opportunity to harp on about the inputs that signaling design needs from you, then you are sorely mistaken, my friends. The design that, that uh, signalling needs from track and civil includes agreeing on the datum, the track arrangement, which includes gradient, curvature, toe of points changes, and clearance point changes, the location of platforms, including the endpoint changes and the stopping point changes, track speeds, which include speed on, on plane track, speed on curves, and the special case of curves being the diverging leg of points. For level crossings, we need to know about the road edge changes, and we need to know about the crossing width. What I mean about by crossing width is the distance from when the road user enters the crossing, so be that the, the boom barrier or the gate, through to when they are in a safe point, safe place on the other side. Any structures that, and also any structures that affect signal fighting. Landmarks, including bridges, overpasses, etc., and any changes of formation. I may cho choose to use uh, track circuits with insulated rail joints. There's going to be mechanical stresses where you've got to change a formation, say, from a ballast bed to a slab track bed. And you may not want me to put insulated rail joints near that, near that uh, change of formation. I may use track circuits that have electrical separation joints that will not play nicely, say for instance, where you've got one half of the electrical separation joint over a cast iron bridge and the other half on ballast. From the operations people, I need to know how the trains will move on the track layout and how that's going to, and how that's going to happen. For as best as we can see, over the lifespan, over the lifespan of the uh, of the equipment, that's usually fifty to 20, sorry fifteen to twenty years. So, wow, what's going to be running lines? What's going to be sidings? Where do we want the running movements to be between to and from? Where do we want the shunting movements to be to and from? And of those running movements and shunting movements. Which ones do we need to be able to happen simultaneously? What traffic patterns do we need and their frequencies? What are the control arrangements? So where are the signal boxes? What are the, which signal is going to control which bit of the, of the area? For rolling stock, I need to know the train types. And for each train type, I need to know its permissible speeds. I need to know braking distances. For signal spacing, I need to know service braking distances. For where I've got an environment where I'm using fully braked overlaps, I need to know what the emergency braking is so that I can add uh, some safety margins to that and get my overlap lengths. I need to know some acceleration characteristics. I need to know the train lengths. From the electrical people, the traction people, I need to know substation and tie station locations and, and electrolysis bonds. Where those cables are connected to the rails will affect where I can place the ends of some types of uh, track circuits. 
air gap locations. An air gap location is going to affect where I can place signals because if I wind up with a train stood at a signal such that its pantograph is bridging the air gap, that may uh, result in some very big currents flowing, which will, which will result in the failure of the catenary. Overhead wiring masts almost inevitably get in the way of signal sighting. What tracks are wired? So that's going to affect my bonding design, that's going to affect my uh, uh, in the, where I've got enforcement that uh, might allow me to prevent electric trains from entering non-electrified lines. So, the design inputs are distilled into a scheme plan. The scheme plan could be as, as simple as this, or it could be a bit more interesting like this. In broad terms, the scheme plan specifies against a schematic of the track arrangement, the location, function and identity of the signalling objects such as signals, points, track circuits, level crossings. From the perspective of the interlocking, where we need to wind up is with the interlocking logic. For railway-based interlockings, this would be in the form of circuit drawing, such as uh, shown at the top. For processor-based interlockings, this would be in the form of ladder logic or Boolean logic or a technology-specific language such as SSI data, sh as shown at the bottom. But it is difficult to go directly from the scheme plan to the interlocking logic. So there is an intermediate design, the control tables, that tabulate from the scheme plan the functions that need to go into the interlocking. And here is one that was prepared earlier. Who is the audience of the control tables? As we mentioned before, it is an input for the interlocking logic designer. Once the interlogic log interlocking logic has been constructed, the principles tester who validates the interlocking will use the control tables to record the outcome of the testing. The signaling maintainer may also use the control tables for fault finding. Concepts and terminology. Points. The scheme plan will show where the points are. Give each one an identifier and nominate the lie of the points. Note that the scheme plan shows each track, i.e. pair of rails, as a single line, not two lines. In the example shown here, these are 51 points. The terminology for the lie of the points stems from the terminology used on mechanical lever frames. The lies are called normal and reverse. It's a bit of an anachronism, but we need to call it something. The scheme plan shows the normal lie as the continuous line. In the case of 51 points, when the points are normal, they are set for a train going from the, from the left to the bottom right, or vice versa. The scheme plan shows the reverse lie as the broken line. In the case of 51 points, where the points are reverse, they are set for a train going from the left to the top right, or vice versa. Multiple point ends may be grouped together so that they coact. In, in this case, the signaller cannot control each point end individually. When the signaller calls the point function normal or reverse, all of the grouped point ends will drive normal or reverse. This helps reduce the number of functions the interlocking has to deal with. The scheme plan shows each point end with the common point function number. In, this case, in the case of this crossover, the point function is 51, with point ends 51A and 51B. Of particular interest in the control tables is the clearance point. This starts from the fouling point, which is the point where a vehicle on the normal leg of the points will just touch a vehicle on the reverse leg of the points. However, we don't want to have trains only just not touching each other as they go past. And the wheels, which is what activates the track circuit or axle counter, are set back from the end of the vehicle. To allow for this, the clearance point is a few metres further away from the toe of the points than the fouling point. Routes. Within the interlocking, we use an abstract construct called a route. The route is defined by the entrance signal and an exit point, which is often also a signal. 
The route is named firstly after the entrance signal. Many railways use, a let use letters to identify the different routes from the signal. If you are a driver of a train standing at the entrance signal, then the leftmost valid route from the signal is the, route, is the A route. The next valid route to the right is the B route, and so on. Trains occasionally exceed their movement authority, which is a signal passed at danger or spat event. Perhaps the train driver misjudged the braking. A mitigation that many railways use for spads is to have a safety margin beyond a signal, called an overlap. In the situation here, for 11 signal to display a proceed aspect, not only must there be no train between 11 signal and 21 signal, but there must also be no train within the safety margin, the overlap. Each railway will decide what it considers to be the desirable overlap length. However, when designing the scheme plan, there are many competing requirements, such as headway and the physical constraints of a particular site. Sometimes the desired overlap length is not reasonably achievable. In these circumstances, we allow the overlap length to be reduced, but we need to add other safety controls. To distinguish between these scenarios, some railways have different classes of route. Where the full overlap is available, this might be called a main class route. Where the reduced overlap is provided, this might be called a warning class route. Main class routes and warning class routes are for running movement authorities, where the driver is being authorised to travel at a speed faster than would allow the train to stop short of any obstruction. However, sometimes we have an operational requirement for the driver to only proceed being prepared to stop short of any obstruction. As they have different risk profiles, some railways distinguish between two scenarios. Where one of the trains might have passengers, for instance, joining two passenger trains together on a platform, and where passengers are not involved, such as train, a train ending, entering a depot or a siding. For the first scenario, the route might be called a call-on class route. For the second scenario, the route might be called a shunt class route. Last but not least for concepts and terminology is track sections. I'm assuming that we're using track circuits or axle counters. We're going to divide up the railway into track sections. Each track section, a track circuit or an axle counter section, is going to tell the interlocking whether or not the track is occupied or clear. Some railways use letters to identify each track circuit. Here we can see that AB track is clear, AC track is occupied by a train, and AD track is clear. Enough concepts and terminology. Let's now look at a point control table. Set point function, which may, each point function, which may consist of multiple point ends, will have its own control table. Usually this is divided into three main areas, normal to reverse, reverse to normal, and time of operation locking. In both the normal to reverse and reverse to normal areas, there will be a box called requires track circuits clear or similar. What goes in here first is what is called the deadlocking tracks, the tracks with the point blades. These days, this is, this is a line of last defense. If trains are being moved under degraded working, perhaps there has been a signaling failure of some sort, then we aren't going to allow the points to move if there is a train in the track section with the point blades. If we did, the train could derail. In this case, we aren't going to allow the points to move normal to reverse or reverse to normal if there is a, if there is a train on AC track. Where we can, we have the deadlocking track extend at least as far as the clearance point. However, sometimes this is not reasonably practicable. For instance, there may be another set of points which needs its own track circuit. The risk is that there is a train on the foul track and a train going along the other leg of the points which sideswipes the train that is foul. 
we allow the points to swing towards the train that is foul so that another train could couple up to it. But we don't allow the points to swing to the position that would allow a side swipe. In our case here, we prevent the point from going normal if the foul track, the A track, is occupied. The next column is set by routes column. If the signal sets 11A route from 11 signal up to the top right, we want the interlocking to call the points reverse. If the signal sets 11B route from 11 signal to the bottom right or sets 12 route, we want the interlocking to call the points normal. But what is going on with 14? To go from to go from 14 signal to 12 signal at line speed, we want a safety margin in case the train spads. This is the overlap. So if the signal sets 14 route, we want the interlocking to call the points normal to create a valid overlap. The next column is the route normal column. Once a route has been set, we want to prevent the points from being called to the other lie until we don't need the route anymore. Most of the time, this is just the opposite of the set by routes column. For instance, once 11A route has set the points normal, we are going to prevent the, point, the points from going back to reverse until it is safe to do so. The next columns are the released by columns. Once the train has entered the route, as we will see later, the route can normalize within the interlocking but we need to keep the points locked in the current position until the train has passed clear of the points. Taking 11A route as an example, the points need to be locked in the reverse position until the train has passed over and cleared AB track, AC track and BA track. But again, what is going on with 14? If the train running 14 route is well behaved, it will come to a stand at 12 signal. We can estimate that the train has come to a stand at 12 signal if AD track is occupied for a long enough time. Once this has happened, we can free the points as we no longer need a safety margin. The train is, after all, at a stand. But if the train does bad, we want to hold the points in the correct position until the entire train has cleared AC track. Within the normal to reverse and reverse to normal areas, there are actually that, sorry, there are usually columns that relate to swinging overlaps. In the previous examples, we considered trailing points in the overlap. However, if there are facing points in the overlap, for operational flexibility, we may wish to be able to change the overlap. Sorry, but this diagram still has its Victorian nomenclature. Let's say 12 signal is set with the overlap over 15 points normal and up to 16 track. The signaler may wish to swing this overlap over 15 points reverse and up to 23 track. This might be a precursor to setting 14A route. Before we allow 15 points to move, we need to confirm that the new overlap is OK. 23 track is clear, 23 points are normal, and 26 route is not set or in use by another train. Not in this signaling arrangement, but it may be necessary to swing another overlap out of the way. It can all get very messy very quickly. And that is as far down that rabbit hole as we're going to go. The last area in the points control table is for the time of operation locking. If we have a swinging overlap, we destroy the validity of the overlap for a short period whilst the points are swinging. Some railways do not allow the overlap to swing if the train is now close to the points. In the example here, the points are close to 13 signal. The train is now close to 13 signal and if the signaler was to swing the overlap and the train was to spad, the train could reach the points before the points have completed their throw. So time of operation locking prevents the overlap from being swung in this circumstance. And that is as far down that rabbit hole as we're going to go. Route control tables.
Each route will have its own control table. Let's use 11C route, that is from 11 signal to 25 signal as our example. A route control table is typically split into three areas too. Route requirements, signal requirements, and route releasing. The first part of the route requirements is usually points set or free. To set 11C route, 51 points must be normal or free to be set normal, and 52 points need to be reverse or free to be set reverse. The next part of the route requirements is usually route normal. To set 11C route, we need to ensure that other routes have not already been authorized to run 12, 14 or 16 routes. If we were to allow that, then the two trains could collide. 16 route is what we call directly opposing. All of the points are in the same line. The route that we are trying to set, 11C, requires 51 normal and 52 reverse. 16 route also requires 51 normal and 52 reverse. So we need to prove 16 route normal before we can allow 11C route to be set. 12 route is a different story. When 12 route is set, it will lock 51 points reverse. In the previous columns, 11C route needs 51 points normal or free. When a train enters 12 route, it will hold 51 points reverse until the rear of the train has gone past 11 signal. So 51 points does all of the hard work for us and we don't need to include 12 route in 11C's control tables. But what about 14 route? I'm glad you asked. Yes, when 14 route is set, it will lock 52 points normal. In the previous columns, 11C route needs 52 points reverse or free. But what happens when the train enters the route? When the train is on AC track, it will hold 52 points normal. However, when the train gets onto AB track and off AC track, 52 points are now free and 51 points are normal. So 11C's points requirements are now fulfilled. And, and unless we do something more, 11C would be able to set with the train still moving towards 11 signal. So we do need to include a 14 route in 11C's control table. This is called indirectly opposing. Whilst the points initially do the hard work for us, as the, trains prog as the train progresses through the route, eventually they, the points required by our route free up behind the train. The tracks in the released by track circuits clear column ensure that when a train is running 14 or 16 routes, that 11C route cannot be set until that train has completely gone past 11 signal. If 11C has multiple classes, these would be proved normal here. For instance, if this is actually the control table for 11C main route, the route normal column would also have 11C warning, 11C call on and 11C shunt if they exist. We don't want to be able to set multiple routes from the same signal at one time. In this area, there are other columns for uh, track circuits occupied or clear or occupied for time. But these mostly relate to call on and shunt routes, and we aren't going to disappear down that rabbit hole. If the signaler requested 11C route and the uh, route requirements we just went through are satisfied, the route will set. Conflicting routes will be locked out and the points will move towards the correct position and hopefully be locked in that position. But we can't just assume that the points have moved to the correct position. All manner of things from blow-in fuses to coke cans can prevent a set of points from moving completely to the correct position. So the first column in the signal controls requirements are points set, locked and detected. 11C route requires that 51 points are proved to be set, locked and detected normal and 52 points are proved to be set, locked and detected reverse. Previously, we checked that no opposing movements have been authorised, 
but there might be a train in the route that is, is, a, is that is at a stand or is moving in the same direction. So the next column in the signal control requirements is track circuits clear. I've added a few extra track circuits onto the scheme plan. We need to prove all of the track circuits clear between 11 signal and 25 signal, as well as to the end of the overlap at CB track. We also need to prove that any tracks that are foul of the route are clear. In our case, a train may have spatted 12 signal and is now foul of 11 C route. We don't want to sideswipe this train on BA track. There is also a point set and detected column in this area, but this relates to swinging overlaps. There is usually also track circuits occupied column in this area, but it usually relates to route classes other than main class. Let's just stick to main class routes. Usually we want the signal to be a one shot. The signal that clears the signal for one train and one train only. If there is another train, the signaler must again perform a conscious action to clear the signal for the second train. What we don't want is for one train to go through, the signaler to be busy with other things and forget to cancel the route. And once the first train has sailed off into the sunset, the signal to re-clear and a second train to take the route. It may be that the signaler wants the train to stop here, and now that the train has kept going, it will cause a traffic jam further on down the track. Or perhaps the signaler wants to send the second train via a different route. How this is achieved is by stick control. When the first train goes past the signal, on some, on some railways, it requires both the berth track and the replacement track occupied. The interlocking remembers this and won't allow the signal to re-clear for a second train until the signaler requests a route. Conversely, the signaler may wish to reduce his or her workload and allow a signal to automatically re-clear after each train has passed through the route. There is usually an automatic working facility provided field on the route control table, which is either yes or no. By this stage, we have proved everything required to allow the signal to clear to something other than red. But what should it clear to? Yellow? Green? Pink over purple, maybe? This depends on the aspect sequence used by your railway. A typical yellow, green, red sequence would result in something like this on the control tables. So when the next signal is showing red, we would show yellow on this signal. When the next signal is showing yellow or green, we would show green on this signal. Many railways prove that the next signal is a light, proving, for example, that it doesn't have a blown bulb for some or all of the aspects. If the next signal is not a light, this, this signal is typically restricted to red. The driving and proving of various enforcement systems, such as AWS, TPWS, train stops, etc., are included in this area, but this is heavily railway dependent, so we'll leave well alone. The last, area, the last area on the route control table relates to what happens when the route goes back to normal, either after the passage of a train or after the signaler manually cancels the route. Firstly, there is the approach locking. The signaler may have a valid reason to put a signal back to stop when a train is on the approach. Perhaps they have just received a phone call saying that a car is stuck on a level crossing and the quickest way to advise the train driver is to, uh, to stop is to put the signal to stop. Perhaps there has been a derailment up ahead. There are many possible reasons. When the signaler cancels the route, the signal will go back to its most restrictive aspect, usually red. However, the train may not be able to stop before the signal, in which case the train will enter the route. If we release the route as soon as the signaler cancelled it, the points in the route would become free conflicting routes would be able to be set, and so on. If the train en then enters the route, it would be unprotected from this. So we must maintain the integrity of the route until one of three things. One, there is no train. That is, there is no train that has seen an aspect that tells that this signal was at proceed. In other words, prove all the tracks clear back to the last signal that changes state when you put this signal to stop. 
and then go a little bit further back to a sighting point, usually about 10 seconds behind that signal. This is an optional test. Two, the train stops before entering the route. This is usually estimated by using a timer. For instance, if the train hasn't entered the route after, say, two minutes, then it has managed to come to a stand. Well, three, the train enters the route. Then the integrity of the route is maintained in exactly the same way as though the train entered the route with the signal at proceed. The other part of normalising the route is train operated route release. In order to reduce signal workload, the interlocking can be configured to automatically normalise the route after the passage of a train. This is mandatory if route storage, route stacking or automatic route setting systems are in use. This often uses a sequence of, a sequence of tracks occupied and clear to do the train operated route release. So, in summary, we covered the context of a control table, including design inputs, scheme plans, and interlocking logic, and the audience. We covered concepts and terminology relating to points, routes, and tracks. And we went through the basic fields in typical point control tables and basic route control tables. Thanks for listening.